Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Chief James Robinson. Thank you. Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you tonight, and I appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend it with me. And I'm hoping we can have a conversation about trauma. It's un unfortunately something I've seen a lot of in uh, my career in emergency medical services. And if someone wants to volunteer to be the acronym police, tonight, I would appreciate that. Um, if, if I uh, end up using acronyms, I imagine many of the other speakers here um, tend to speak in jargon too, and I don't want to leave anybody behind on acronyms. So raise your hand if I use one that I haven't previously uh, explained. You're going to be the, you're getting pointed out as the ac acronym police, so, <laughs> so uh, we'll take you. Um, I thought that the, the back of an ambulance would be a, a good, um, a good uh, canvas for our discussion tonight. So um, I'd like to invite you into my world a little bit and, and uh, talk to you about um, trauma care in the United States from a pre-hospital perspective. And pre-hospital sort of um, implies that we're part of a system of care, which ideally we are um, in emergency medical services or EMS. Um, and so hopefully, if everything works correctly, the things that we do outside of the hospital or in, as implied by the name before the hospital, um, then that should contribute positively to a patient's outcome. And hopefully that's the case, but unfortunately, um, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that that's the case. So tonight we'll talk about a little bit about trauma in the United States. And trauma, we're, um, I'll just, quickly define that as um, physical injury to people. Um, we'll leave the, uh, there are lots of different types of trauma, but we're talking specifically about injuries to the human body. So um, as far as disclosures go, I'd like to just say that uh, I'm not being compensated for being here other than by my employer who's paying my normal salary. I don't have any financial conflicts or relationships that would um, change anything I'm going to say to you tonight. Uh, my opinions and assertions are just my own um, and are informed by nearly 30 years in emergency medical services and my experiences on the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine's um, Committee on Military Trauma, Trauma's health, uh, Learning Health System and its translation to the civilian sector, which was released last year. Um, I'd like to thank the National Academies for the invitation to be here with you tonight, and I'd like to thank um, them also for the opportunity to be a part of that committee. Uh, it was truly a life-changing experience. Um, I thank my employer for the support, the IAEMSC, or the International Association of EMS Chiefs, for the, the good work that the organization does on behalf of patients everywhere. And I really appreciate my committee mates, who you see in the picture there, who are one of the most dedicated, devoted bunch of people I've ever had the blessing to be associated with. Um, and thanks, lastly, to Cecil Holmes um, for providing the picture that is in the background there. Uh, and probably most importantly, I'd like to thank my beautiful wife, Heather, who's here with me tonight for her support, and my, my kids, Mia and Daphne, and my mom, for supporting me through all my various endeavors. Um, I couldn't do it without you. So, onward. Why? Um, I've developed a pretty strong sense of social justice over my career in emergency medical services, and, and uh, it's really difficult to talk about trauma without considering the backdrop of the longest sustained military conflict in our country's history. Um, since 2003, uh, we've had multiple theaters of operation in, in the military, and obviously it's fairly intuitive to think about trauma and, and war associated with each other. Um, what, what may not be so intuitive is what, what war does for, for uh, the advancement of medical science. War, every war that the United States has ever been in has advanced the care of injured people. Um, and if there's anything good about war, which it's most often difficult to find anything good about war, that may be one of the things that actually is good. 
is that it, it tends to improve the way that we care for people who sustain traumatic injury in the military and also in the civilian sector. And it's that bi-directional exchange of information and, um, and practice that is one of the rare benefits of armed conflict. So we, you know, when we think about um, war and what we learn from it, uh, it's unfortunate, but we have a short memory sometimes and that we lose a lot of lessons that are paid for in the blood of our servicemen and women. And unfortunately, um, we, this predictable and repeating pattern is, is not something that will likely change unless we intervene. And we have an opportunity to do that now. I think we've learned a lot of lessons throughout the conflict that began in 2003. And um, we've, we've made a lot of advances. It's, we just would hope that the green dot um, continues to go down and that we don't have the corresponding upward uh, red X uh, in the next conflict. And the, the red dots represent the interwar periods where some of those lessons, unfortunately, over time get lost. And prior to the next conflict, uh, we're, we're moving backwards again. And so General Corelli came and advised our committee and, uh, and, and gave us some perspective from the military. And um, in, his, in his role, he has a pretty good idea of what's going on in our military. I'm, I'm not a military guy, but I have deep and profound respect for the men and women who put themselves in harm's way to, you know, to defend our country and to further our national interests. And um, Peter Corelli had this sobering quote to our committee, um, which when I reflected on this, this, this was, uh, it was pretty disappointing, actually. It makes you think about, you know, going back to the previous graph with the, uh, um, with the, the dots and X's on it. That that's, that's exactly what he's describing here, is that in, by year five, we're, we're starting to learn the lessons that drive that case fatality rate down. The case fatality rate is, um, is a patient's course from the, from the point of wound, basically, into rehabilitation. And there are obviously the unsuccessful attempts at, at health care. Um, but, but that is a sobering thing. And, you know, it, it, uh, it, makes, it makes you a little bit pessimistic about, about where we are. And, but, unfor but fortunately, um, we, there is some cause for optimism out of all this. And this, this graph represents um, Operation Enduring Freedom case fatality rate uh, in Afghanistan. And what you see on the top line there is the injury severity score, which is a, a score of, of uh, six body systems that includes your face, head, chest, abdomen, extremities, and skin. Um, and injuries to those body areas generate a score and what you see there is an increase in injury severity. And that was due to high ordnance explosives, um, much more lethal, um, much more uh, the lethality of ordnance, the lethality of the types of attacks that our servicemen and women were subjected to. And what you see on the bottom line there is the case fatality rate. And the divergent lines there is, is a great cause for optimism because it means that despite the fact that there are much higher levels of injury, our survival rates are also are going up. And so we're getting better at providing trauma care to our servicemen and women. And this is, this is an opportunity. And this is something that hopefully we can translate, as we have in past conflicts, to, uh, to the civilian world. So one particular element of the United States military that was able to demonstrate profound changes in their ability to care for, for the servicemen as a unit was the 75th Ranger Regiment. And it was this regiment that really provides a roadmap for us in the civilian world for building a trauma system that can save lives and, and improve survival and outcomes in, in Americans. And this was a topic of great discussion among our group and the, the best way 
uh, that the Rangers were able to improve outcomes was by defining the problem first, which was they had a nearly 30% preventable death rate. And by preventable deaths, what that means is that uh, if, if a soldier is injured and receives optimal care, um, that there, there is a likelihood that they would survive that particular injury. So by using data from the joint, trauma, joint theater trauma system, um, really brilliant practitioners in the United States Military Medical Services were able to kind of parse out those data to determine that their casualty, their potentially survivable injury rate was 20, I think it was between around 25 percent. And by, by the leadership of then um, Colonel uh, Stanley McChrystal, um, the Rangers were able to implement corrective actions to reduce that number dramatically. And the goal was zero preventable, zero potentially preventable deaths. And that's an that's a ambitious goal, but it, but it set a roadmap for the Rangers and, who were able to actually implement corrective actions to drive that number down to under 3%. And that's the model that we, as a committee, decided that we were going to uh, to build upon in the civilian world. And the Rangers trained not only their medics, who are highly skilled to perform medical interventions, but Colonel McChrystal made medical training a core component. It was one of their big four, the most important command uh, priorities for that unit. And when he made medical care um, a core component, every Ranger was trained to treat each other. And so that, that pushed the time window for definitive care, it, it shortened that time window. The Rangers were caring for each other. They were capturing a, with data um, information that they could feed back into that loop and to continue to drive continuous improvement. And we're hoping that these are the types of opportunities that we have in the civilian sector to, to learn from this conflict. So I learned a lot being a part of this committee. I, I learned a lot of things that I, I don't know if most Americans know. I'm sure this is a, a really intelligent group and probably some of you knew some of the things that I didn't. Um, but being a part of trauma care in the United States, I was, I was profoundly moved by some of the things I learned about trauma care. And, and the incidence of trauma in, in America. Um, trauma is the number one cause of death under age 47 in the United States by a, by a long way. Uh, it's, it has a huge economic and societal burden um, economically in, as a result of direct medical care and, and uh, lost productivity um, in one year amounts to nearly $700 billion with a B. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's the number one cause of productive life years lost uh, under age 75. And, it's, uh, and we started asking ourselves, why does it not get the attention that other disease processes get? And, and trauma is a disease as categorized by the National Institutes of Health, et cetera. So, why? This is a, a, all causes under age 47 of, of death in the United States. So it's a big deal, and we're, we're dealing with a big problem, and we've approached it as a public health problem for a long time. And uh, we had some really spirited discussions about how, how do we get the public's attention on what is really a, a huge national problem. And I appreciate you all being here tonight to be part of that discussion, and hopefully it will inspire you um, to, to give it some more thought, and what, what can we do as a country to reduce that. So the civilian world isn't much better than the military as far as having a short memory. Um, we, we've been talking about trauma really for, for a long time in our country. And on a national level, 
1966, the, the paper on the far left of that timeline there was is a paper that was released by the National Academy of Sciences back in 66, which was called Accidental Death and Disability. And it, in my circles, um, it's kind of given the, uh, the moniker of the white paper that really started emergency medical services in the United States. Um, because what basically the conclusions of that paper were were that you were more likely to survive if you were injured in Vietnam than you were if you got in a car crash on an American highway. And that really drove an enormous political discussion in the country to, to do something about trauma on American roadways. And it was th that in conjunction with the, uh, the Highway Safety Act of 1965 that really were the drivers of um, increased automobile safety, seat belts, speed limits, a lot of the things that, you, that we associate with, um, with injuries from automobile accidents. And, and uh, unfortunately, although we've studied trauma all the way across that timeline, to, even to our most recent report, um, which is on the top right there, the findings in our report 50 years later are very similar to the findings from 1966. So where is the disconnect? Uh, this was kind of the driver of our committee's effort. We, why, why can't we figure this out? Um, we're, not, we're not learning the way that the military trauma system learns to drive those numbers down. So, you know, based on what we've learned from the military and where we are, and, and by no means do I mean to uh, give you the impression that we haven't made advances on the civilian side either. Uh, um, civilian trauma care uh, in the United States is probably the best in the world. Um, but, we, but, but we can do better. And we, we have a lot of lessons. We have, uh, we're ripe for this opportunity. We have a, a, a bunch of great trauma learning systems that have been developed by the United States military. We have, we have this workforce and these systems in place in the civilian world that are ready to take those lessons from the military and to, to build upon them and to translate them back to the military. This should be a continuous improvement cycle across military and civilian sectors. So this is what it should look like. Um, and this is from another uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, publication about learning healthcare systems. And really, this is what the United States military built. They, they ins insisted on um, data capture from the point of injury through release back to functional living. Um, and they were able to track, and, and it's not perfect, um, but it's far better than anything that we have currently in the civilian world, uh, where the data associated with patient care is disconnected all along that spectrum. Um, and so um, having a system like this with bi bi-directional translation of lessons learned from civilian to military and vice versa, we have an opportunity to, to build something that will save American lives and to improve outcomes. And this is really what led to our goal as um, a committee, which is a national trauma care system. And I'd like to say that one exists now, but it doesn't. Um, we don't have a national trauma care system. We have two silos. We have a civilian silo and a military silo, and the two are not really connected. And that was one of the findings from, from our committee's work and uh, something that we proposed uh, a lot of suggestions and uh, recommendations to hopefully try to cure. So, uh, these, these were the sponsoring agencies for that report, and uh, a lot of the folks in the room, um, we certainly appreciated the support of all of, of uh, the sponsors of this research project, um, and everyone's trying to do the, the same thing. We're trying to save lives and make lives better, and reduce morbidity, and reduce mortality among not only servicemen and women, at, that are around the globe doing their thing every day, but people like you and me 
who are traveling back and forth from work every day and living our regular lives. And hopefully, you know, when we have, uh, we'll have a little bit of time here at the end to, to discuss this, but I, I would love to get your perspectives on why the disconnect and why, you know, why hasn't trauma garnered the same sorts of attention that other disease processes that have far, far less morbidity and mortality have. So this was our report. Um, it was 431 pages. It was, uh, it's, a, it's a hefty read. Um, but, and I have the website address at the end of the presentation, that, um, but if you'd like to download the report in brief or the, um, it, I think that one's a little over 30 pages. It's a little bit easier to read than, than the 400 uh, pager, but definitely worth your time. Um, and this is, we came up with uh, 11 recommendations and uh, 61 findings in there that, um, that inform kind of where we could go from a policy perspective and from an operations perspective with United States trauma care. So the first recommendation was we had to have an aim. Like what are we trying to do? And um, we, the, the aim for this was zero preventable deaths after injury. Uh, we borrowed that from the, the Rangers playbook and, and that, that was our aim of our committee was we're going to say, we're going to reach high and say, we want zero preventable deaths after injury. We had a lot of discussions about what that means. And um, zero preventable deaths would kind of imply that maybe we should prevent the injury from happening anyway, right? Um, so injury prevention is obviously, it's a huge component of trauma care. Um, but, but it was a little bit outside of the scope of our committee's work. So we, we said, we put the qualifier on it for after injury. So after you've already been injured, the aim is that you will survive that injury. And these are sort of a, um, a summary of our recommendations. Our leadership recommendations, we, we felt because this crossed civilian and military, um, it had to have a, a significantly high level of government oversight and um, the ability to compel executive branch departments to, to participate and to adopt this as a goal. So we felt that the only place that could really do that was, was the White House. Um, and so our goal was to compel the White House to first set, set zero preventable deaths as a, as a national aim uh, across military and civilian sector and then to um, compel the, uh, the agencies associated with that and the lead agencies in the military Department of Defense uh, for military health care and the Department of Health and Human Services on the civilian side, compel those secretary level positions to make this a focus, um, which is what really led to the Rangers success was having leadership that said, this is what we're gonna do, this is the direction we're gonna go and here's our target, go get them. And we felt like we needed some, someone at that level to do that. Um, data sharing, if we're going to have a joint trauma system that incorporates military and civilian sectors, then we have to be able to share information across those two. So it has to have some, a data system that will share information across those. And we need to improve research. Um, the military was very successful because they reviewed every case. They reviewed every case um, to, in detail and shared those lessons learned on conference calls constantly. So they were informing, going back to the continuous improvement cycle of learning healthcare systems, they were, they were gathering that information, they were adjusting practices in real time almost um, based on what they were learning and then incorporating those lessons into future care. Um, and that's what we need to do as a nation. And then we wanted to make sure, um, I learned, one of the things I learned about the military that I found uh, just mind blowing was that the number one procedure performed by military physicians is vaginal childbirth. And I had no idea of that. Um, 
But what that tells you is that there's a, a vastly different mission between um, peacetime and wartime. And in peacetime, military physicians are providing dependent care primarily, and in, in, during wartime, they're providing trauma care. And unfortunately, and this is, you know, these were insights learned from the committee work, um, the physicians who end up going into theater may not be trauma surgeons. They might be obstetricians, they might be podiatrists or other types of surgical specialties that don't do trauma care. And when I asked uh, my colleagues from the military sector who were on the committee with me, well, what, what do the medics do when they're, you know, when they're not deployed? And in unison, they all said motor pool. <laughs> so I can turn a wrench on a Jeep, but I'm not getting any patient care experience as a provider, as a paramedic, as a medic. So, so there's a big disconnect there, excuse me. And that's the problem with the readiness piece, is that the readiness piece is now, it's, it's a brief observation and introduction to trauma surgery before they're deployed. Pre-deployment readiness. And that's a, that's a big deal because uh, um, I can't remember who to attribute this to, but I'm, I'll just say the quote anyway. You can't read enough books about golf to be Tiger Woods. <laughs> you know? So you end up, you have these people that are observing trauma surgery, but they're not really doing it. And, and uh, so you can see a problem with that. And, and I think as those people are deployed in theater for a while and they have the opportunity to actually get their hands on, get feedback, get real-time insights, get, um, you know, get mentoring from people who are skilled working with them, you can see why that, that curve goes down for case fatality over the course of, of combat. But you can also see why when they get back after combat and they do vaginal childbirth, why they're not very good at trauma surgery anymore, right? Makes sense. So, which brings me kind of to the pre-hospital perspective. Um, I'm an EMS guy, emergency medical services, um, which, which is often equated with a vehicle, an ambulance. Um, which is typically where we do our work, um, but not always. Um, but uh, we, the practitioners of emergency medical services, um, don't like to think we're just ambulance drivers. We like to think that what we do in the field actually matters and that we actually can make a difference in outcomes of patients. Unfortunately, we don't really know if we'd make a difference, except in certain cases, a, a very narrow slice of cases. Um, because we don't have any research foundation to build, uh, to, to actually improve our practices on. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about the pre-hospital sector. And what I've learned over my career is that everything's about trust. And this is in, in emergency medical services. And, and I think this translates across the military and civilian sector as well. The kind of trust I'm talking about is almost mother-child kind of trust. When people call me in an ambulance to come to their home at 3 o'clock in the morning, um, they don't clean their house and fix their hair or get dressed or anything like that. Um, they meet me at the door and they say, come in quick. They don't, they don't ask me, do you know what you're doing? Are you a criminal? Do you, uh, you know, do you steal? Um, do you have any idea, or are, are you educated? Um, do you, you know, they don't ask, are you on drugs? They don't ask any of those things. They invite me into their home, and then they hand me their baby. And, and I undress their baby, or undress them, put my hands on their bodies, ask them questions that they wouldn't answer for their closest friends, and they never have, there, there's no relationship. So they're giving me blind trust that I know what I'm doing and that I'm going to give them the best care possible. That they're going to get the state-of-the-art care. I think this, the military servicemen and women probably feel the same way. 
when, that they, they're going to get the best care, not, they're not going to get their intestines operated on by an obstetrician. So they, they feel everybody involved in this exchange is basing it on blind trust. And for me, that's always been a driver of, of my efforts to always do a better job and do a good job. Because I feel like that, that trust is a transaction that if the public's going to give me that, then I owe them the best every time, my best, the best that I can do every time. And I think that's where we, we are as a country, is that we owe that to each other and we owe that to our servicemen and women. So it presents us with some challenges and opportunities in, in the pre-hospital sector. We, um, we have a hard time in a lot of areas because we're a very fragmented discipline. Um, we have all kinds of different system designs, EMS system delivery designs that are largely informed by local choice. Um, the, they grew up in communities. Um, in in uh, the EMS service of the 50s, it was oftentimes handled out of mortuaries, which presents a little bit of a conflict of interest, if you ask me. <laughs> You know, do I take you to the hospital or do I get more for the actual embalming and stuff? Uh, so you have a, um, and, but the real reason behind that was because that was the only vehicle where you could lay somebody down and work on them. And, uh, and so that was, that, that was uh, very common in a lot of places around our country. And over time, um, through federal legislation and uh, demonstration projects funded, um, by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and the Department of Transportation, we had the growth of emergency medical services systems around the country. And, and those systems um, are, were grown in isolation, basically. And they didn't really talk to each other. They, the, the demonstration projects and federal money was contingent upon, excuse me, um, specific elements of system design. But, but really, they all kind of grew up and developed their own way. So, which brings me kind of back to this, this quote of where you live shouldn't determine if you live. Um, and I attribute this to Dr. Patty Gabo, who was, our, uh, who was um, the Denver Health Chief Executive Officer for many years. Um, uh, and I heard her say this a lot. I didn't give it as much thought as I have um, as I've grown in the profession, but, but really this, this kind of disturbs my sense of social justice. And we have, in America, uh, this is an unfortunate reality. And we haven't, one of the biggest problems with this is that we really have a difficult time answering that question if, if it determines whether you live or not, because we don't have the information. So you as the public, and me as the public, I don't really have a way of measuring the effectiveness of my EMS service, or, what, or whether or not when I show up at three in the morning and you're in your bathrobe, you're gonna get the best care. We don't have the measuring stick for that. So that's an opportunity, and I hope that's something you'll give some thought to when you, when you leave here tonight, is that um, those are questions that seem to me that the public should have answers to. Why, don't, why can't I tell if my EMS system is effective or not? So what's that, what that has led to is, um, in, in most cases, the, uh, the equation of time equals quality. And that's not always the case. It is in trauma. Um, the faster you can get to a surgeon, the, the higher likely you, likelihood you have of survival. Um, as long as we do our little magic in the back of that ambulance on the way. Um, but not always even then. Um, there are some studies out of you know, the South Pacific where people survive better being thrown in the back of a pickup and driven to a hospital than they did waiting for EMS to arrive. There's something to chew on. And we've seen that a lot recently with, um, you know, my, in my own state with the Aurora Theater shooting. Uh, where a lot of those patients were transported by police cars. And same in uh, 
in Las Vegas, um, with the shooting in Las Vegas. Uh, the majority of those patients did not arrive in ambulances. They were transported by Uber. Um, and, and I'd like to say I'm joking, but, but I'm not. Um, and Uber actually put out, um, at least according to some of the folks I've spoken with, uh, Uber put out an alert to all their drivers to, to go to the scene and pick people up. That's kind of an ingenious thing. Self-organized EMS. So I think it's, you know, we have an opportunity. And so I think the first opportunity is kind of in, in line with that, is let's, we got to help ourselves first. One thing that I think the Las Vegas example and some of the other examples show is that no matter how much money we want to spend, we're never going to have enough emergency medical services personnel and equipment to handle all those things. So we need, we need to be able to bolster the resources that our, um, that our discipline has with helping ourselves. We need to be self-sufficient, um, get back to, I'm, I'm from Colorado, I'm a native, I live in wild, wild west land, and in Colorado, one of the things that I think I really appreciate about our culture is that we're self-sufficient and that we help each other. And I, and I think that's something we need to get back to. Rather than waiting around for somebody to come save me, I'm gonna save myself and I'm gonna save my neighbors. And I think that's a huge thing that you've seen with the White House initiative on Stop the Bleed, where there's a national effort to educate people on controlling hemorrhage, which, which by the way, was one of the causes of preventable the, it was the primary cause of pre preventable death that the rangers found, and which is what led to the proliferation of tourniquets, tourniquet use across the United States military. Um, was, that was the number one cause of preventable death, with people just bleeding to death. Um, when they implemented tourniquets, that was part of what drove that number down. So that's, that's one piece. And if you think about the, tr this is the trauma chain of survival. The top of that chain is, is us. It's you guys. It's the, it's the public. The care that the public can provide. And there, there are analogs for this in, in cardiac arrest, for example, where early CPR and defibrillation can actually improve long-term outcomes for patients and survival. Same thing with, there's no reason, and the rangers prove this, they trained all their non-medical personnel to put tourniquets on. And they, they all did it effectively and they all did it accurately. So there's no reason why all of us can't learn how to use a tourniquet or to control hemorrhage with direct pressure. So these are the kinds of things that I think we need to be thinking about and pushing as a country. So we need to build capacity. And this I talked about this a little bit about um, augmenting EMS resources with the public resources, which is C, help ourselves above there. Um, if we look at examples like the Madrid train bombing, the Las Vegas example, the Pulse nightclub example, um, pick one. We could sit here and talk about them for another hour. But the public is really the first responders. And as much as we in the uniform services like to go, well, the uniform public safety services, not the military, but as much as we like to go, hey, you know, we got it. We're going to put the, the yellow crime scene tape up, and you guys stay on that side, and we'll handle this. Really, what, what it means is we need to get rid of that paradigm. We need to say, please help. If you're there first, do something. Jump in there, help your neighbor, help, the, help an, another American. And there are examples of this around the world too. The Israelis obviously, you know, they have a lot more experience with this. We, have, we as a country are fortunate that we haven't had our knees buckled very often. But, but they have, and they've learned from all those experiences. And so you, you see some things like uh, what really is self-organized EMS in Israel with people on scooters who, who are just helping their, you know, their neighbors. Um, the, 
the fee for service, this, the funding model for EMS nationally is a problem too. And the funding model is fee for service, like most healthcare, which means we are going to, um, you know, we, we have to provide the service first, and then we get reimbursed typically for less than it costs us to provide the service, um, like, like many other facets of medicine. And so, but the problem with that is that it leaves no capacity because to, to stay alive, you gotta, you gotta live on your margin. Um, I can't have any extra stuff sitting around because that means that's non-productive and that's not gonna produce, you know, that's gonna cost me money to sit there. Unfortunately, in EMS, we have a responsibility to, to have the ability to surge. Um, so we gotta figure out how to do that. Is that incorporating the public? Is that adding more, you know, more resources? Is that augmenting reimbursement-based payment with preparedness funding? I, we don't, I don't know the answer, but these are the questions I'd like you to think about. And then national certification would be awesome because right now it's, Real, there's no way for me to go to another state and help them unless that, that state that I'm going to says, I don't care about your malpractice, I don't care about your level of training, as long as you're a certified paramedic in your state, you can practice in my state. Um, and that usually only happens through interstate agreements like the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. But EMS providers in the federal government services like the FBI, the DEA, um, the Coast Guard, all, uh, lots of the, the uh, law enforcement services have EMS support personnel. And they can't go from one state to another and practice in that state without violating that state's law if they're not licensed there. So nobody's really ever pressed that. But it's, but it's a problem. So we don't really have standards. As I mentioned, it's difficult to say whether or not we are doing a good job. And if the community you live in does a better job or a worse job than the community you live in, um, we don't know. Um, we, one of the only things that we really measure fairly well is, is cardiac arrest, which typically comprises less than 3% of an EMS system's call volume. So cardiac arrest, we have a pretty good idea between communities in so much as they report them, um, whether one community does better than another. But we don't know that about trauma. And that's a problem, particularly because traumatic injury is such you know, a, a, a common occurrence in our country. Um, oops, I'm sorry. We also don't have um, the evidence-based research base um, on which to make policy decisions. So it's difficult to say that we should design an EMS system this way or that way because we don't have the research to support those types of decisions. And, it's, and, and nobody's paying for it. So there was a, I wish I would have remembered to put this this graph in here, but there's a graph from the National Institutes of Health on um, the prioritization of funding, research funding based on the societal burden of that particular injury. And trauma's at the bottom. It has the, it, it, it has the, the least commensurate funding for research of any disease process um, compared to the societal burden it represents. So that's another problem, and, and you know, I, I don't want to be skeptical, but I'm a paramedic, so I shoot holes in everything. Um, it seems to me that it's just not sexy enough, or it doesn't, it, it doesn't have the, the, the political or societal following that breast cancer or other types of, of uh, disease processes have that get tons of funding. Um, so that's something we need to figure out. Um, we had a lot of discussions about the, the approach, of the public health approach to trauma care because we, we've talked about the statistics. They're staggering. They're, I mean, I can't see how those are not compelling statistics. 
It's the number one cause of death under age 47. So why hasn't that motivated public outcry and action? And we had some discussions about whether or not that's because people don't view it as a disease. Maybe they just think about it like that's bad luck. That's just something that happens to you. There's really nothing you can do about that. That's just kind of bad luck. Um, or is it maybe we need to take it from a national preparedness approach? You know, back in the, the civil uh, defense days, people were taught first aid. They were taught to, you know, seek shelter and, and act. Um, we've kind of trailed off from that because we don't have that imminent existential threat. I mean, maybe we do, but <laughs> pick a day, we might. Um, but, but why? You know, why aren't we having those conversations and what, why aren't we doing something about it? So uh, those are things I hope you think about. So thank you so much for, for spending this time with me. I'm, uh, I'm seriously humbled by the opportunity to be here with you. I hope we can have a little bit more conversation about some of these things. And I put the link for the, um, for the National Academy's website that has our report, the report in brief, and some of the other recommendations um, from our, our committee. And I, and I would encourage you to at least give the report in brief a read and give some thought to the things that, that, we've been talk that I've been talking about and I hope that you will be talking about. So thank you very much.